This is lesson 3.1 entitled Functions. You should be on page 104 of your book. In this lesson, you will learn how to determine whether relations are functions, how to find the domain and range of a function, and how to identify the independent and dependent variables of a function. If you are not great at mental math, this lesson's for you. It's all vocabulary based. In fact, you really don't have to know a lot of arithmetic to get this done. This is pretty much do you know the terminology. So if you're willing to take the time to know these terms, you should be good at this lesson. Let's start with vocabulary. A relation pairs inputs with outputs. So when I say relation, relation, anytime you make an XY table or you have a set of ordered pairs, you have what's called a relation. When a relation is given as ordered pairs, the X coordinates are called inputs. I would definitely get that in your notes. And the Y coordinates are called outputs. So when you look at this table down here, and you, you guys have worked with XY tables before, an XY table could also be thought of as an input-output table. X is the input, Y is the output. A relation that pairs each input with exactly one output is called a function. So a, a function is a special kind of relation. Each input only gives you one output, or each X produces one Y would be another way of thinking of that. Let's look at these samples. Determine whether each relation is a function and explain how you'd know. Well, let's look at A. The input negative 2 produces an output of 2. That's one output. The input negative 1 produces positive 2. Negative 1 gave me one output. Zero input gives me 2 as an output. The input 1 gives me 0 as an output. And the input 2 gives me 0 as an output. Do you notice that each input is only giving me one output? Now, some of the outputs might have been the same. That's all right. But each input only gives me one output. So the relation in A is a function. Each input only had one output. Now, let's see how that's different than sample B. I'm going to take my highlighter out. Do you notice in sample B, the input 4 gives you the output of 0? But then later on, the input 4 gives you an output of 3. Do you notice how the input 4 is giving you two different outputs? That's why the sample B is not a function, because each input is not giving you just one output. Same in sample C. Do you notice the input 0 is giving me two outputs? It could give me 5 or it could output 6. That's not a function. Each input can only give you one output. In sample D, now this is a function. Here's why. The input negative 1 is giving me an output of 4. The input 3 is giving me an output of 15. The input 11 is giving me an output of 15. Each input is only giving me one output. Now, sometimes I see each year people get confused and they're like, well, wait a minute, Mr. Lemansky. I had 3 and 11 both give me 15. That's fine. Think about it. Input 3 gave me one output, 15. Input 11 gave me one output. 15. As long as each input can only produce one output, it's a function. So in D, that's definitely a function. I would like you to pause the video and you try these four. Determine whether each of these relations is a function or not and be able to explain how you'd know. Pause the video and do that. Okay, I'm back. Question one. This is definitely not a function because you notice how the input 5 is giving you two outputs. It's giving you 0, but then it can also give you 10. That's not a function. 2 
this is a function. Each input is only giving you one output. Negative 4 produces 8, negative 1 produces 2, 2 produces negative 4, 5 produces negative 10. Same thing in, in number 3, this is definitely a function. It is a function. Number 4, this is not a function. 1 half is producing 3, and let me write them down here. The number one half, the input one half, is producing one, two, three different possible outputs. That's not a function. I think real quick in your notes you should add this. I'm pretty sure you know that's a table. But this picture is called a mapping diagram, and I'm not certain that you would know what that is. So I would get this in your notes. This is called a mapping diagram. It's similar to a table. This is just saying the input half is producing, it's arrowing to all of its outputs. It has three different outputs. It's called a mapping diagram. Core concept, vertical line test. Now, in the previous example, you learned how to look at a table or ordered pairs and determine if they're a function or not. Here, you ought to be able to look at a graph and determine if it's a function within a few seconds. You can do that by what's called a vertical line test. A graph represents a function when no vertical line passes through more than one point on the graph. That's called the vertical line test. I would definitely get that in your notes. Let's look at two samples here. Now this sample is a function and here's why. If I drew vertical lines through each of these points, you notice how each line only can touch one point. That's a function. It passes the vertical line test. Now over here, look here. I could draw a line and it's touching two different points. That's not a function. It's passing through more than one point. Not a function. Okay? Let's test these. And let's see if these below are functions or not. So in part A, let's use the vertical line test and try this is definitely not a function because you notice if I do this, I'm touching two points. That's not a function. Okay? Not a function. Here, now this one is. I could draw vertical lines wherever I want, and you notice none of these vertical lines are touching any more than one point. So this graph would be a function. Okay? I'd like you to try, oops, you try these. Okay? Try those. Four. Pause the video. And I'm back, and you probably already saw I gave the answers away. This first one, this is a function. I could draw vertical lines. They're only going to touch one point. This function again. All my vertical lines could only touch one point. This graph, certainly not a function. I could draw a vertical line that's touching two points. And this one is definitely a function. Again, it, each vertical line could only touch a point. Finding the domain and range of a function. A domain of a function is the set of all possible input values. Now think about it. The inputs are the x's. The range of a function is the set of all possible output values. The outputs are the y's. So I have a couple of notes on that. X is another way of saying domain, or input is another way of basically saying domain. Domain is the x's or the inputs. Range is y or the outputs. This is a great picture. If you could imagine an old computer like you see on old movies where I could take a number on a slip of paper, stick it into my 1970s computer, and then that computer would make some noises and stick out another piece of paper. That's a good visual what a function does. You take a number, you put it in the computer, the computer does a calculation like right here. You stick negative 2 in the computer, the computer takes negative 2 and multiplies by 3, which gives you negative 6, and then the computer spits out negative 6. That's a great visual of what a function does. Okay? You put inputs in the function, and it produces outputs. 
Let's go down here. It says find the domain and range of the function represented by the graph. Well, for this one, I'm going to make a little table. And let's check here. Here's a point. It's the point negative 3, negative 2. So x negative 3 would output y negative 2. Or here's another point, x negative 1, y 0. Input negative 1, output 0. And then here, 1, 2. If you input 1 for x, the output would be a 2. And then finally, 3, 4. Input 3, output 4. Do you notice these numbers are my domain? That's my x's. And these numbers are my range. That's my outputs. And you notice the book is doing the same thing. They're just putting it in ordered pairs. I did it as a table. So you can see my domain is matching what they have, and my range is matching what they have. Now here, for this one, this is not just a collection of individual points. So here we have to use an inequality. Now isn't that ironic? We just finished a chapter on inequality. So Let's take, let me take my highlighter out. Do you notice that for the x's, the lowest value for x, the farthest left we go on this graph is negative 2, and the farthest right we go is 3. So my x's would be anywhere from negative 2 to 3. That's my domain. Can you see that in the graph? Okay, let me take a different color marker. And let's look at the ranges. The lowest this goes is negative 1, and the highest this goes is positive 2. So my range would be negative 1 for y up to positive 2, which is what they have here. That's how you can find your domain and range from a graph. I would like you Try. Try those two. Find the domain and range of the function produced by this graph. Pause the video and do that. Okay, and I'm back. And so for this problem, I made a table of the points. You can see negative 2, 4. And here's negative 1, 2. And here's the point 0, 0. And here's the point 1, 2, and then 2, 4. So you can see from the table, my domain are these values, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2. And my range, you can see some of these numbers repeat. I didn't write them twice. 0, 2, and 4 are my range values. Over here, I color-coded. You can see for my x's, the lowest we go for x is positive 1, and the highest we go for x is 5. That's why my domain is from 1 to 5. 1 less than equal x less than equal 5. Again, I'm writing it as an inequality, just like we talked about last chapter. And then my range. Can you see how the lowest we go is 0, but the highest is 4? That's why my range for y is 0 less than equal y less than equal 4. Okay, so to finish up, let's talk about identifying independent and dependent variables. The variable that represents the input values of a function is the independent variable because it can be any value in the domain. The variable that represents the output values of a function is the dependent variable because it depends on the value of the independent variable. Now off to the left, I wrote this down and you might want to put this in your notes. These terms that I put in the top box all tell me the same thing, like x, domain, input, and independent variable. Those, all those terms are kind of telling me the same thing. They're telling me these are x, these are the inputs, these are the domains, these are the independent variables, all the same. Where y, range, output, and dependent variable are all saying the same thing. When an equation represents a function, the dependent variable is defined in terms of the independent variable. You may be like, what's that? That means y will always equal a statement that involves x like you see here. The statement y is a function of x means that y varies depending on the value of x. In other words, get, if y is by itself and equaling a calculation involving x, 
That's what y is a function of x is saying to us. It means y is by itself and x would be involved in the calculation. Okay? Let's talk about identifying independent and dependent variables. The function y equals negative 3x plus 12 represents y, the amount y in fluid ounces of juice remaining in a bottle after you take x gulps. Identify the independent and dependent variables. Well, that's easy. The dependent variable, remember, that's the y value. That's here. The dependent variable is y. The independent variable is the one that does the calculation. That's here. I've got to take x, multiply it by negative 3, and add 12. That's the independent variable. Part B, the domain is 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. What's the range? Well, remember, domain is x. So if I make a little table and I put 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 in the table, then if I put 0 in here, negative 3 times 0 plus 12 would be 12. And you can use your calculator on these cal calculations if you want. If I plug 1 in here, I'd get 9. If I plug in 2, I'd get 6. Plugging in 3, negative 3 times 3 is negative 9, and negative 9 plus 12 is 3. And if I plug in 4, I have 0. Okay? So in other words, if I take one gulp of my juice, I would have 9 fluid ounces remaining in the jar is what that's telling me. What is the range? Well, that's easy. The range would be these values right here. My range would be 0, 3, 6, 9, and 12. Okay? I would like you to finish up the video by pausing and trying these two questions. And I'm back for number 11. This function represents the number A of avocados you have left after making B batches of guacamole. Identify the independent and dependent variables. Well, B is what we're doing the calculating with. That's my independent variable. And A is, is the isolated variable. That's the dependent variable then. If the domain is 0, 1, 2, 3, that means the domain is my X's. And right now my X's would be the B's. So I have that here. And the independent or the dependent variable, I meant to say, that's the same as the y values. And in this problem, that's the a's. That's what's isolated. So if I put 0, 1, 2, 3 in for b, I will get responses of 14, 10, 6, and 2. That would be my range. And there is number 12. We have a, a statement here where the temperature of an oven is equal to 19 times the, the number of minutes plus 65. Identify the independent and dependent variables. Well, again, that's easy. Dependence here, that's the t's, which is like the y's in this problem. And m would be the independent variable. That's like the x's. A recipe calls for an oven temperature of 350. Describe the domain and range. Well, if the temperature is 350, I can take 350 plug it in for T, which you see I did here, 350 equals 19M plus 65. Take away 65, divide by 19. That means it takes the oven 15 minutes to preheat. So my domain, when I first turn the oven on, that's at the zero minute mark, it's going to take anywhere from zero to 15 minutes of heating to get my oven heated. That's my domain, which means my lowest temperature the oven would be, if I plug a zero in here, would be 65 and my oven is ready at 350, there's my range. I'm going to pause the video here. If you have questions, make sure you ask in class.